I was in Cambodia um, when um, the hearing for Doik, the, the, the director of what is now known as the genocide, the, the, the genocide Museum S21 in Cambodia, where 14,000 people were brought in and tortured and their confession elicited, and then they were shipped out and, and, and killed in mass graves, otherwise known as um, in, with the, part of the Cambodian mass graves. Cambodia is a country the size of the state of Oklahoma, and to put things into perspective, it is today littered with over 20,000 mass graves. And so now we have one man that had been put on trial, had been on trial, and, and was convicted for crimes against humanity and war crimes. And sitting there was so powerful for me. First of all, I went into the courtroom, which is a small space, and I think it fit about 400 or so people. Um, and there were international journalists all over. Um, but what really moved me was the number of Cambodians in the courtroom. And in, in the front rows, there were a group of 29 students who had taken the day off of, of, from university to come and listen to the tribunal. And then right behind them, there were a row of a couple of dozen monks in orange robes. And they were just sitting there quietly meditating as if sending healing energy to this shrine. Steve gives me chills. And then just right next to them, there were groups of, of women and villagers in their sarongs um, and in their clothes and village clothes and, and look, look, looking like they just come from the, the rice field. And they were the survivors of um, and, and had loved ones who had been killed in torture in this place. And we were all speaking to each other. And what we shared were, yes, the stories of how we suffered, but then we held each other's hand and shared the story of how we are now surviving. Some of us are surviving, some of us are thriving, some of us are teachers. And I remember one woman was telling me how she, um, she was a math teacher and she never spoke about it. And then she started speaking about it because the tribunal was being broadcast and people were getting information and she just couldn't stop. And she was embarrassed about it when she was crying in her classroom and her student said to her, don't stop. We want to hear this. Please go on. And next to her, where the woman grabbed her hand and we were all crying together and she said, um, I didn't talk about it and I never really had any issues, but in, recently I just found that my throat and my face had begun to swell because she had kept it in so hard that her face were now reacting to being suppressed and now it was her chance to speak and then she started and once she started speaking her face was feeling better and better and mm -hmm. it's like PTSD how it came out in all these different ways um, so for me the tribunal uh, is not really about finding justice but it's a, an opportunity for survivors to have the space to speak their story and to be heard to be believed because the other things that we went through was that once we started speaking after the war many people did not believe us and I remember this very clearly in, in, in junior high school, telling a girl my story. And after I shared it a little bit, she looked at me and she said, I don't believe you. And that silenced me. And that also made me question how she looked at me. Did she really think that I was such a damaged soul that I would make up the executions of my parents um, and how the world needed to know what really happened so that people would be believed. And for me, healing is, is, is not, there's no final destination to your healing journey and your experience. Mm. I wanted that, I want it to be that. And, and I think in a Western culture, we, we, we in a way view it like that, that trauma is like this brick wall. And when you're suffering it, you are living in black and white. Things are a little bit muted, your skin's not so vibrant, you feel everything, maybe you're not, not so colorful. And then there's this brick wall of, of trauma. And if you can just somehow break through that wall to the other side, everything would be just become technicolor. And then munchkins would sing the lollipop songs, and, you know, and the flying monkeys would come out. And, um, and it turned out not to be, because every time I've had an experience or trauma that I needed to heal, first it was my, my ex first experience with, with depression in high school. When my body started to change, I, I didn't know what to do with it. And in the changing process, it became also very traumatic. Because the last time I've seen that much blood coming out of a human body, they were dead or dying, and I was convinced I was going to do both. And then I broke through that wall and made sense that it was the war and not my body's changing that made me depressed. Um, and then I thought, well, it's over. 
but then the next experience will come, the next trigger will come. So I see it as a journey that some that I'm going to have to learn about. And, uh, and I'm sure there is going to be more PTSD that I don't even know yet exists in my body that I will have to deal with in the future. So for me, in, in terms of what I hope, I hope I continue to be conscious and aware of, of my healing journey and, and because that's one way to protect myself. Um, I hope to be continue to, um, through my writing, through being a restaurant owner um, um, and also an owner of a microbrewery where I make beers and raising money for <laughs> 10,000 villages to be an activist, to affect change, to contribute somehow, some way, in whatever capacity I can to make this world a better and a safer place for all. And we can all do this as a mother, as a student, as a writer, as a singer, as an activist. Um, so I hope to always continue on this in whatever capacity. Um, and also to continue to keep the pride and, 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 to, re and to be that bridge for um, not just the next generations, but the generations before the generations who cannot yet speak their, ex their story and their experience, just, just to serve as, as, as uh, to not just capture my stories, but other people's stories. So, so I, I hope to continue to be there and have some fun along the way. Have some fun, eat lots of food, do a little bit of yoga. And, and the healing journey, again, has been very long um, for me. Um, I, I, I'm a, I, I've always kept a journal, and it was always more... Um, I thought a lot about my, I think about stuff, period, as you can tell. I think about things constantly. I'm thinking about the sky right now as well as being here. Um, and, and, and yet to, to take it from here to out was the longest journey. Take it from my heart and my mind out of my mouth was the longest journey. And in my relationship with Mark, who I met when I was 20 in, in college, um, it, our, you know, it took us 12 years. Well, it took me 12 years to commit to him. And, and really it wasn't to him. It took me 12 years to commit to love. It took me 12 years to commit to life. It took me 12 years to say to myself, I can love, I can be a partner with somebody else and even if he dies, life will go on. And I can't be afraid of that. It took me 12 years not to be afraid. And, and Mark um, is an extremely patient man. Um, and, and for me, there hasn't been any specific moments where I am all of a sudden open and bloomed up like these flowers. That would have been nice. Um, but it has been small opening, um, small little petals at a time. And in my case, it was more like onions. Um, peeling off layers of onions at a time and then crying and then making other people cry. <laughs> and then eventually you got a little bit to make a little saute. Um, but... Um, thank you for laughing, because <laughs> I, I don't even get that joke, but it was just there and I don't filter. Um, and, and, but for him, it, I think ultimately it was every time I opened up to him, he didn't judge. He didn't judge and he listened. Um, a few times he tried to rescue, I put a stop to that. Um, and, and he just, he was just there, he was just there, he didn't leave, he didn't leave. And that was my biggest fear, that they would leave either through death or through their own choice.